one of the you know key definitions of big data is in terms of the variety of data. And so whether it's, you know, we all know we've been doing business intelligence for a long time. We understand how to analyze data that fits in neat traditional databases. But unstructured data, things like text, video, images, that's a little bit more challenging. And so I'll talk about how Intel actually had a use case around text analytics and how we um, use that in our own IT operations to improve our um, capabilities in predicting client incidents before they actually happen. So I'll dive into that a little bit later. So with all that, you know, the, the business of that foil, really to me, what it boils down to is the left-hand side and the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, you have the asset, right? Big data. And on the left-hand, on the, on the right-hand side, you have analytics, right? Being able to now mine all of that data. And you merge those two things together, and that's where you get that intersection of value. I think I once read somewhere, um, someone described big data as really the new oil of the 21st century. So what oil meant to the 20th century, that resource, you know, big data is a resource out there to be mined. And the folks who can do that um, stand to um, realize real competitive advantage because if you don't do it, surely your competitors are doing it. So how many people have heard of these, the four Vs of big data? Okay, just about half. I think almost everyone has. I was just gonna skip this slide because Quite honestly, I get tired of hearing about this. I think everyone knows what big data is all about, right? The volume, the velocity of the data, the, the variety of the data, and the variability. And you know, we've been seeing fifth, five, other Bs like value, et cetera. So, you know, pretty well understood. And I don't want to waste too much time on this. But just a level set, you know, this is how Intel IT, how we look at big data. And this is how we define it. And this is important because, you know, when this was a you know a hot topic last year, still a hot topic. You know, we had a lot of our business unit um, stakeholders and customers, if you will, were coming to us to IT and saying, we want a big data solution. Whether they needed one or not, they wanted a big data solution. Because we're all reading about it every day, how big data can do all these things. And so we all want to benefit from it. But this is a good way to just kind of level set. And big data is not the answer to everything. And I'll go into that. So, you know, this slide here is talking about, you know, what's generating all this data. You know, why big data now? And it's coming primarily from three, three sources, among others. One is machine-generated data. You know, machines from on the edge of networks, all the way to web logs, to network routers, things we don't even think about. But all of this stuff is generating data. So we all hear about how a flight from city X to city Y generates, you know, Z petabytes of data. And so machines are generating all this data and can be mined that. And I'll talk about how Intel is doing that with all the PCs in our enterprise. We have about 100,000 employees, and we also are collecting data from those PCs um, to better predict or prevent machines going down. Then, then there's human-generated data, right? All the emails we send, the pictures we take, that we share, we upload to Facebook, et cetera. And then, of course, we have our business-generated data. So all this data being generated by these three sources, but it's not just a once, there's not just any one solution to address all of these. And the key point here is that there are different solutions to address these. Whether you're looking for a scale-up solution, an in-memory solution, or an extreme data warehouse, or a massively parallel processing system, a distributed scale-out um, solution through things like Hadoop, and even through edge analytics that are being done on the devices themselves. So there are different solutions for all this, and I'll show you how Intel IT, how we've done it. Because we started with a one-size-fits-all enterprise data warehouse. And you know that had some advantages, but with the onset of big data, we had to expand that out. And so we actually added four data warehouses to our traditional enterprise data warehouse. So here's a slide that talks about that fusion, that, that connection between everything that's happening on the edge of a network and how all of that funnels back in to the data center for processing. Because all the magic of big data really happens, you know, where all the hours are pointing, in the data centers do that the analysis to provide those personalized recommendations, to provide that unique insight. So whether it's the supply chain and looking at inventory, whether it's analyzing how customers are interacting with various um, devices and advertising, to cameras, to the transactions that happen in stores, to RFIDs, these, this is all data that should be analyzed and merged together. And the second part, merging the data, it's not easy because we all know folks who are in IT and who've been doing this 
for a while know it's not easy to get data in the right format. That whole ETL, the extract, transforming, loading, is, is very challenging. And remember, most of the work takes place before you can even begin to mine within so. So just a couple of quick stories here um, to, to kind of illustrate this. Um, I'll start with one industry example, and you know, maybe I'll just do this very quickly. But how many folks, and I'll share one about what Intel is doing. Um, but the, the first one, how many folks have heard about the target um, scenario? Not the fraud uh, detection, but before that, but the, the whole pregnancy. Uh, um, so yeah, okay, so everyone's, I won't, I won't go into that story. But an example again of how retail is using this to better market to customers, and almost even you know, to get to the point where it causes problems. The second example is an Intel example, and it kind of goes to the second picture. You know, we all go shopping at the malls, right? Some more than others, and you know, we're kind of immune to advertising, right? We'll see ads, whether it's a video on a screen or a billboard. We kind of just walk by it. So if we see an ad for, you know, we're walking to the mall and, and we see Michael Jordan or some celebrity talking about the latest shaving cream or something, you know, we know, oh, it's Michael Jordan. He's probably been paid a lot of money to say what he's saying, and, and it doesn't really affect us. Um, especially, um, you know, marketing folks have done some research on this, especially items that we, you know, buy, like things like, um, that we buy routinely, like tooth, toothpaste, um, things like that. We don't even think about switching brands. It's just something we just buy. We've got a brand that we're comfortable with, and we just buy it, you know, regardless. And that's a real challenge to marketers, right? Because they're obviously always trying to find ways to get you to switch to their brand. And you know, one of the things that they found is that unless there's some major life event that happens in your life, like graduating from college, getting married, getting a new job, it's at those points where people tend to have, where people tend to be the most vulnerable to switching brands. And so a lot of these retail companies are trying to find ways to know when that's happening, even before it happens, so that they can intersect those points. So that's the kind of research that's happening to get folks, you know, to um, you know change and, and to personalize marketing. So anyway, going back to this example of the shopping mall, you know, so we're immune to this advertising. But one of the things that we found is that when you go to this digital advertising kiosk, if you see an ad, instead of it being you know celebrity like, you know, say George Clooney, if you see instead an actor that's like half the celebrity and half you, you're more likely to listen to that message than if it was just a celebrity. So what's happening here is that you won't know that this is happening, right? But this, this digital advertising has got a camera, it sees you, it merges these two images together, and so this person looks vaguely familiar to you. You don't know that it's, oh, it's half you, half the celebrity, but it's someone that catches your eye, and you're more likely to pause and view that ad than you would otherwise. So pretty interesting things. And so all of that requires compute at the edge, of course, um, which is you know, where Intel is playing, and of course at the data center as well. So just some um, you know, interesting things, innovation that's happening you know, across, not just from the data center, but all the way to the edge. And Intel is helping enable that. We're working very closely with our retail partners, and they of course love it, right? Everyone wants their, their message to be heard. So, so now what I'd like to do here is transition and talk about kind of the spectrum of big data, the evolution of big data, um, and how that fits into the larger context of business intelligence. So folks have been doing BI for a long time, right? So if you look at the left-hand side of this um, continuum, the descriptive analytics, right? Just being able to understand what happened historically. And then the diagnostic analytics, right? There's what happened and then why it happened, so you can understand that. Now, where big data really plays, and the reason why this is, you know, you have all this hype around it, and why the hype is real, why the promise is real, is because now you want to be able to predict the future. What will happen based on this? And now, if you can predict the future and understand and get a good sense of what you think is going to happen, then the next question, even more valuable than that, is understanding what should I do about it? How can I change the future, so to speak? And, and that also ties into the preemptive analytics, right? So how do I change the future, and what additional value can I add for customers before they even realize it, right? So even this example I was talking about earlier with the digital advertising. That's the real value of big data, and this is why there's such huge promise, and why you know, folks should be investing in here. Okay, so with that kind of broad context, you know, the promise of big data, you know, I now want to talk about Intel IT, because we're a real IT shop with 
fixed re finite resources, right? And so we have to optimize and maximize those resources. If we're investing heavily in big data, something else has to, you know, has has to be invested in. And so it's um, I want to make that point because this is not something we're doing just to do, right? When we, you know, evaluated this, we thought long and hard about the investments we were making. So before I go into all that, uh, let me just quick background on Intel Corporation uh, and, and Intel IT. So Intel Corporation, uh, Intel IT, we support about 100,000 employees, you know, worldwide company, right? It's mostly now 164 Intel sites across 62 countries. Um, in IT, we have about um, uh, 6,500 IT employees, you know, 59 IT sites, right, globally. So right there, just those, the, if we compare our 59 IT sites with 164 Intel sites, we're obviously supporting folks, right, where we don't have a physical presence, which a lot of IT shops and a lot of companies do these days. We have about 68 data centers. We've been able to consolidate um, a lot of our data centers through things like virtualization and cloud computing. Um, and we support about 150,000 you know, connected systems, um, including 40,000 handheld devices. So that's a little bit about Intel and Intel IT. See the idea of the scope and the magnitude of what we're doing. And now what I want to boil this down is to IT in particular. So this pyramid, if you will, is what inspires and motivates all 6,500 IT, Intel IT employees, including myself. And the way it starts is at the bottom, right? Delivering services. That's the, the basic, keep the business running, service level agreements, making sure the lights are on. And that's kind of how IT was traditionally viewed for a long time, right? You call IT when something's broken. But that's all changed now. And the reason why it's so exciting, you know, personally for me to be in IT is because we now have the opportunity in IT to transform the business. But before you do that, so you move from this you know, keep the business running, support the business as a foundation to contributing value. And what I mean by that is working very closely with our business units and even helping to influence them and collaborate with them on their business plans. Because really, IT is the business. You can't launch a new business without IT anymore, right? And so it's, you know, we now have a seat at the table and play a very critical role in the success, or failure for that matter, of new initiatives, new businesses. So, you know, really exciting. Um, and then lastly is the ability to transform the business, right? And, and I, I talk about all of this because you know, the reason why we're investing so heavily in big data is because big data and advanced analytics allows us to move up this pyramid. It's a very important point. Again, we're not doing it for the sake of doing it, but we're doing it to help Intel transform its business. Any questions on this? Um, do folks in the room, you know, agree with this? You guys, do you guys see this, or do you think, um, you know, no? It's you know, the, the other thing too is that when cloud computing, cloud computing, by the way, is another key initiative. So big data is one. Cloud, social, um, mobile, um, are other key initiatives for us that are helping us move up this this pyramid. But you know, even with cloud computing, there was I would hear folks say, you know, is IT going to be outsourced? Right? Is, it, is IT turning into a utility? And um, you know, I don't see it that way at all. In fact, I see it as now IT being even more critical in making some of these decisions and working with the business units to understand you know, what's right for the business. And sometimes it means going off-premise, sometimes it means staying on-premises, and even with big data, um, you know, whether we run our big data workloads in the cloud or on-premise, you know, all, all of those factors are contribute to what's making IT so critical to success in the business. Yeah. No, I don't. So there's three different kinds. So you, you know, so there's your public cloud, your private cloud, and your hybrid, right? So the public cloud is mostly you know hosted data centers, hosted servers, off-premise. Private cloud is of course you know virtualized you know infrastructure, on-premises behind your own firewall. And then hybrid is if you're using both and using software workloads. So that's one side of the cloud. So it encompasses all three of those. And the other side is infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or you know, software as a service. So when I say cloud, I'm referring to all of that collectively. And you know, of course, we have. Um, you know, I was actually involved in this area before I moved over to big data. Um, you know, very detailed strategies on where to use what when. Because the public cloud isn't your answer for everything. Um, private cloud is where we started. We use SaaS for you know basic non-differentiated applications. For instance, you know, expense reporting. 
I imagine that you know we at Intel don't do expense reporting any differently than any other company out here. So why should we go develop our own app and host that inside? We use software as a service solution for for non-differentiated applications like that. But of course, you know, data and applications that are core to Intel's business, you know, design processors, we keep that internal and secure models. And then we use hybrid and other areas. So we've got a pretty well thought out framework on going to use well there. And same thing with Cloud BI too. So um, you know, I'm actually working on writing a white paper right now and understanding you know, should we use the cloud to run some of our BI or big data workloads? And you know, when should we do that? So you know, agility is a key factor. You can spin up an instance of virtual machine. Um, you can offload some of that, the risk involved um, through elasticity. Do you really want to build out a lot of infrastructure that you may or may not use? You can scale up and down. And also with uh, BI is, where is the data being generated? If the data is being generated you know, outside your data, outside your data center, off-premise, then it may make sense to run some of those workloads in the cloud. It also depends on where your tools are, your user-facing tools, if those are in the cloud or if they already have licenses internally. So all of this stuff factors into even our cloud. Okay, so um, you know, with that said, you know, diving in a little bit deeper now. So you know, we get it, we're motivated, we're climbing up that pyramid, we want to transform the business. So how do we do it? You know, it starts you know, at the left with priorities. When you boil down what Intel does, you know, the 100,000 employees I mentioned um, at the beginning, all of us, all 100,000 of us, really do three things, right? One, we design microprocessors, we manufacture microprocessors, and we sell and market them, right? That's kind of boiling it really down, you know, in, in a nutshell. And so, you know, with that said, you know, IT, we're trying to support, you know, Intel be better in each of those three areas, right? And so with big data in particular, um, you know, we want to make sure that we had use cases that furthered each of those three areas. And I mention that because you know, if I you know, can share with you guys, when you guys are starting out with big data, no matter where you are on the spectrum, it's really important that you don't just do cool you know, science garage kind of projects, right? Because we all have CFOs that we have to um, you know, report to and get funding from. So it's really important just to you know, start POCs in areas that actually matter to your company. Now with that said, let me actually pause here and ask the audience some questions. Where are folks in the room with, in terms of big data implementation? How many folks are just kind of thinking about it, getting the feedback, trying to figure out, you know, if you should do it or not, or if you should invest in it or not? Any folks in that space? Okay. We see about a couple of hands. How many folks are, are now in the space of, okay, um, we see a lot of promise here, but there are challenges like skill sets, technology, and adoption. Uh, how many folks in the room in that space? Okay, more. How many folks are actually doing something here? We actually have real POCs, um, you know, running big data workloads as defined by those four Vs that I. Okay, so about okay, so it's about a handful, of, like, roughly the same as before. And then how many folks are actually um, past the POC stage, investing, have done POCs? and have realized value from those projects and are looking to expand and grow. Look at folks in the front here. Right. There's something to that. You know, the kids who sit in the front of the class are always uh, the ones that get the A's. Okay, so that's great. So, and it, and it kind of it stays consistent with, you know, how I would expect it, right? It, in this continuum of, of adoption of big data. Is there a question? Just curious, the business value number, does that include net of investment or? Yes, it does include net of investment. And, um, you know, but, yeah. To be honest with you though, the investments are kind of marginal. It wasn't that much, right? We're using servers that we had, we're, we're redeploying we're deploying people onto these new projects as we wind down other legacy projects. So the investment cost, you know, it wasn't that much to get this going started. And now especially with cloud capabilities, right? You can spin up an instance, a VM, through things like EMR, Elastic Mapreduce, or others out there. And so the investment is really minimal. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it is net of investment. This is real business value return to the corporation. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about priority? How do you run these analytics initiatives into your life? Sorry, how do we run these analytics into your life? Okay, so the question is how do we run these analytics um, investments programs. programs in our line of business? So yeah, so that's interesting. So that's um, an organizational you know, question too. And so what we did was is that we embedded very deeply with our business units 
to work within a partner and so that we can understand, first of all, is a big data you know, solution what's required or do we want it off on our using our other analytics tools around our data warehouse. So you know, the short answer is you know, working very closely with the institute is we have this formal process um, in terms of understanding what the solution is, and I have a slide on this, various parameters that looks into what's the size of the, um, you know, of the amount of data that we're looking to analyze, uh, how long do they want to keep for governance issues have to be factored in, um, et cetera, and where is the data being generated, especially now in these with cloud and, and these kinds of businesses. So that's kind of the process that we use to, um, to, to, ask, to work with the business units. And in fact, I wrote a white paper on this as well that kind of goes through step by step. It even shows some screenshots of the tools we developed in-house to put a framework around this. Because we didn't want this to just be a, you know, a subjective process, right? We wanted to put some science and some rigor around what we choose to invest in and, and what we don't choose to invest in. Because that's also a key part of it. We've had to say no quite a bit as well, because we just can't do everything. And we want to focus in on these you know, three areas, but additional ones as well. And I'll talk about those. So that was the priority uh, piece of it. And the strategy is, okay, how do we do this, right? Where do we start? And um, you know, for us, it really started in 2011 with our security group. Um, IT Security came to us and they said, you know, we want to you know, analyze and log all these threats and incidents that they were capturing from a security perspective so that we can anticipate and predict them before they actually happen. It was a huge amount of data and the performance that was required, you know, near real time performance, was a huge challenge for us, you know, well beyond you know, the scope of what we've been handling before. And quite honestly, it would just be too expensive to put all that data into our traditional enterprise data warehouse. So really what motivated us you know, to adopt some of these big data solutions was performance and cost, quite honestly, to start with. And at that time, you know, 2011, Hadoop wasn't mature. It wasn't as mature as it is now. And so what we had to do was go um, adopt and deploy third-party uh, MPP uh, stream data warehouse. And that's where we started. And that's how we um, were able to meet the demands and requirements of, of the security BI use case. And then from there, we built out as the Duke matured, um, we, you know, even in memory solutions, we started building out other use cases and, and deploying those containers. So that was a strategy. So right now, I mean, so um, at the end of 2013, and we're growing this, you know, we built out our own internal 16-node Hadoop cluster. Um, they're running on E5 2600s, um, about 96 terabytes each with three-way replication. And so, you know, again, we're starting realistically, and we're starting um, with this real investment. And I'll show you what that looks like, how we've architected our big data platform. And now, of course, as we continue to grow and build out and expand, we're adding to that. So that was the approach, right? To start small. Um, you know, again, we have a finite budget. Um, and we wanted to show real value through some small use cases. And I'll talk about this. One of the things that we always used to um, you know, tell our, our management was this equation of five plus six equals 10. And what that really means, what, what I'm talking about is, we didn't want these big projects that would never end, and we wanted to show real value quickly. So five refers to, we wanted teams of no more than five people, no longer than six months, and it had to generate at least $10 million in, in revenue. So going back to the earlier questions, you know, working with our business units to actually implement these, if it didn't hit any of those criteria, you know, we would say no to it. And we wanted to start there on purpose. We don't want things over $10 million or over six months or over five people. To start, we wanted to go there. And so then, of course, you know, we were pretty successful at that. You know, we did a good job of that um, last year. And you know, we report that to the CFO. And of course, you know, what do they say? You know, great. You know, Intel's a $54 billion company. You know, go find me the $100 million projects. Right, so that's the, the value of upper management. They go, but I should care about the phone here. Yeah. So, so, but it's actually a, a good thing, right? So now we're trying to expand out and invest further and, and and grow. But it's important to start small and to prove that value versus trying to bite off more than you can chew. It doesn't end. You know, management is skeptical to begin with, and then you know it doesn't go any further. So, yeah, and then the the business value, right? Making sure you're generating real value. All right, so this is kind of what I was referring to earlier. Just our evolution, um, you know, where we started. You know, in 2010, and, um, not that long ago, we had this, you know, centralized data management, right? 
we, and that was a big deal for us because before that we had this you know, dispersed line of business um, approach where you know, each business unit was responsible for their own data. And it was no small effort to centralize all of that into one enterprise data warehouse. This is back 2010, even before um, you know, what we turned on the slide. And you know, that was great, right? You know, one size fits all, it's simple, easier to manage. But you know, then of course, you know, big data happened, right? And you know, to be honest, just like other IT, you know, other enterprise IT peers won't be surprised, but you know, cost is what motivated us, um, you know, a lot, right? There's performance and then business value, of course, motivates us as well. But it just wasn't feasible for us to, now with all this data being generated, like the security value use case, the use cases that would be us and of us, to dump all of that in our, in our enterprise data warehouse. And so that's what motivated us to go from this one size fits all to this multi-data warehouse approach. And I'll have another slide coming up that talks about what those other containers are. So you know, we you know we spent you know the better part of a year, two years figuring out what our strategy is. First, you know, meeting the stopgap solution. If it wasn't mature enough, we deployed um, you know, a third-party MVP solution. We decided on which three big data projects you know to go do. And you know we started building out our own internal Hadoop pre-production cluster. Then last year, um, you know, is when we started implementing. It. Last year was you know we were set up, infrastructure built, now go run the stuff, write the algorithms, do all you know the coding that needs to be done, and you know deploy these five plus six plus ten projects that I mentioned earlier. And and we did it, and we were successful. We showed. I'll show you. What, you, you can see these pieces down here below. Uh, what we did and, and and how that was valuable enough for us to get you know approval to build out and expand and invest further here. So now we're trying to go find those hundred million dollar projects, and you know and to do that means continue more investment into our big data platform. And so some of the use cases. So like I mentioned, it's, you know it's it's not only the, the design, manufacture, and sales and marketing that I mentioned in the free areas that plus stuff is in, but even things like our software group, right? As Intel makes acquisitions, Intel IT, and this goes back to the earlier question, you know, partnered very closely with those business, with that business unit, and I'll dive into this use case to help them deliver a better product that was for revenue generation. So again, another example of IT enabling new growth streams. We're not just a cost center anymore, right? We're not just the guys that you know, our views are possible, but we're enabling new streams of revenue growth for, for Intel. Really big deal. Um, we have a use case in, in, in IT, one of my favorite ones actually. So out of all the use cases, and they're all my favorite, but this one in particular, being an IT guy, um, is really cool and it's in predictability. I'll share that with you. The security one is actually where it all started, manufacturing, and of course even in, in HR as well as, as we try to improve. Okay, so this was um, that data warehouse that I was just talking about, how we shifted from this one size fits all. There's a lot of data on here, I'm not gonna go through it. Um, in fact, this is from a white paper um, that I co-authored, I encourage you guys to go find it off intel.com slash IT, or you can um, contact me on Twitter, uh, you can get my Twitter handle. But I'll just call attention to the, um, to the titles and then the, um, the, the categories. And so this is how we decided you know, what data goes where. This, Ultimately, what drove all of this is making sure that we had the right data in the right place at the right time, right? And so we, starting, you know, from the left, enterprise data warehouse, that was our traditional EDW that you know every enterprise has. And from there, we built out these new containers, things like the do, things like our extreme data warehouse or the MPP system I was mentioning, um, even even things like in memory data warehouses as well as we try to go for those real time um, batch processing workloads. And of course, we have this traditional independent line of business data warehouses. So those are our five key um, containers that we use internally. And I'm sharing that again with you in that, you know, as most IT shops here realize, you know, big data is a part of your overall BI strategy. It doesn't replace everything. It doesn't do everything, not yet. Um, as it matures, it is capable now of doing a lot of things, like we are evaluating moving some of our EDW um, data and workloads to the Duke. Um, so it has you know, the potential to do that, but um, again, you know, we're not doing everything all at once, and you know, we're being very smart and methodical. And then on the left-hand side, you can see these are kind of the, the categories or the filters that we use to decide which container is optimal for, for which item. So depending on the size of the data, the performance that's required, um, you know, the velocity, right, whether you, you know, batch, if batch processing is okay, or if you need real-time processing, 
um, the, how long you have to keep the data. All of these factors are what goes into us deciding um, you know, what container to put where. So this is a really cool table. I encourage you guys um, to look into this, the, the white paper where, um, where we have this. Uh, and you know, hopefully you guys can, can learn something about it, or at least see how we did it, and you know, improve on it if you, if you have ideas on, on how to do that. I'm also happy to listen as well. So. Okay, so um, next slide here. So, talked about those five containers. Just diving into our big data platform again. Previous slide talking about our overall BI uh, portfolio. This is the big, big data, and really comprises of three parts. You know, like I mentioned, we started with that MPP platform even before Hadoop because Hadoop wasn't ready um, for performance. Right, it was 100x faster than traditional systems, and these are all based on E7 blades. Um, so, you know. Help us a lot, especially with that security BI use case that, that first came to us. That's where it all started. Um, then, of course, we have our Intel data platform that we're using. Um, this is based on Intel's distribution of Hadoop, among other things, um, you know, optimized for you know, some of the security features that we built into our silicon and our Xeon processors, even our you know, Intel networking, our technical Ethernet NIC solutions, as well as our SSDs. And we're bringing in Spark and Sharp as well, so some of these memory capabilities um, into our. And, you keep it and the last thing we built this in-house predictive analytics engine, and this is what I'm, these are the algorithms that we've been using that we apply to use some of our onto our use cases for our particular workloads. So that's what our that's what it looks like um, from a physical perspective. Now I want to talk about the use cases themselves. So I really want to dive into there's like there's many more as you saw there's six or seven that um, you know, big data use cases. Not all of them run on Hadoop, right? Hadoop does not equal big data. But these three in particular do run on Hadoop. And so I wanted to spend time focusing on those Hadoop platforms. So the first one, a contextual recommendation engine. You know, this is kind of you know, one of the most popular use cases, right? This is what Amazon does, what Netflix does, and recommending you know, books that you might like with things, or you know, even with Netflix, how they recommend movies to you. Is there a question? So, so two things there. So for those who didn't um, hear it, um, the first part of the question was, you know, our business units, are they coming to us, you know, knowing what they need, right? Like are they coming to us with a specific defined problem set and you know and asking us to help? And then the other part of the question, which is you know also one of the bigger value propositions of big data is is you know understanding or discovering what you don't know, right? That insight. Where I don't, you know, I don't have a defined problem. I've got all this data that I want to mine for value, right? And so that's also a, um, a great point as well. And so with the business units, it's mostly the former, right? Where they're saying, all right, you know, I've got this problem. You know, I want to sell more, sell sooner, right? Like the sales and marketing, or even our business groups, right? We all want to do that. We all want to help them tell sell more, sell sooner. And you know, here's our data. You know, how do we do this? So there is some of that, but. but what we're trying to do too is this notion of the democratization of data, and we're trying to bring these advanced analytics capabilities to more than just you know the 70 data scientists that we currently have in the corporation, right? So we've got 70 folks highly skilled data scientists, you know, advanced degrees, masters and PhDs who know this stuff really well. But beyond that, can we enable like our business analysts to you know know how to use rapid mining? For instance, right? It's not that hard, even though they may not have had any particular skill set in college, you know, learning this. You know, Rapid Miner is pretty intuitive. How many people have used Rapid Miner before? Yeah. Okay. A couple of people. Yeah, so I mean, it's not that hard to learn. And if you can get people to understand how to frame a business problem as a data problem, that's no trivial thing, by the way. And so that is taking time. It's not a, it is very challenging for us, and we do have to you know, work very closely with them. You know, we have these frameworks to kind of walk people through so they can understand why we don't just say yes to everything, why Hadoop is not the right container for everything, et cetera. So there is part of that, and, and that does require, um, and that's, you know, that's kind of job one. You know, job two is now, I think what you were alluding to is mining this data, right? This, if I've got all this data, I don't know what I can do with it. Like, you know, my network routers are generating all these web logs. 
you know, and I'll talk about what we did there with our IT ops incident predictability study because there, you know, all the laptops that we support in our environment, we have 100,000 employees, you know, things happen to that machine every day, right? For instance, you'll open a particular application that doesn't open, or an application will crash, or you'll get some malware. All these um, events are being recorded on your PC. And what happens is, is that every 24 hours, all that stuff gets uploaded to a server. It's called our, our web server, our Windows event um, file server. And huge amounts of data. You can imagine 100,000 employees every 24 hours, all this web log data, you know, machine, you know, applications crashing, machines crashing, etc. And no human can sift through all that data. So you know, to his question, we've got all this data. You know, can we get some value out of this data? No, no humans looking at it. We just don't have that many humans to look at it. And what we found, and this is it's been pretty good it's the second one here on the slide. So what we wanted to do is merge um, this, this web log data, right, which was semi-structured. Um, how much time do I have? Um, you're out of time. I'm out of time. Um, <laughs> you're kidding. All right, um, you know, we wrote a white paper on this, it's very cool, but basically uh, combine that with you know, this unstructured um, text data. So when someone calls in to the, uh, the IT help desk saying, you know, my application crashed, doesn't open, or whatever. You know, the service agent you know, is typing all that in. We wanted to merge those two things to see what kinds of events lead up to that incident. Because every time we outsource our customer health, so every time someone calls in IT support, it generates a $30 ticket to Intel, right? So it had a cost savings, and we, we were, the short of it is that, you know, by merging these two things together, uh, we were able to help Intel save um, quite a bit of money, and even, um, you know, save downtime boost employee productivity, and then you got users like me where I'll suffer through a problem, right? I'd rather suffer through it than call IT. So even folks like me benefit from that as well. So just really quickly, um, you know, some more details. I wish I had more time to go through our contextual recommendation engine. Um, here's a screenshot. Um, you know, basically what we're doing here is providing this personalized marketing, these coupons based on various contextual parameters like time of day, the value of the coupon, user preferences, and you know, we found something like a 45% increase in, in the usage of these coupons this uh, recommendation engine we built. Here's this predictability, what I just described. Um, again, I have a white paper on this, as well as a previous thing, previous use case, so you can read more about it there. Um, and then customer insight is, you know, allowing us to understand, you know, which customers are ready to buy when, so we can intercept them and sell more sooner. It's kind of the bottom line of this one. So, you know, really interesting stuff. I wish I had more time. I really wanted to spend a lot of my time there. Uh, but, you know, call to action, you know, a little Dilbert cartoon, you know, basically, you know, I'm going to stick it. Um, so here's some, you know, some practices that work. You know, the practice of data science is vast. In bold are some of the areas that, you know, Intel that we're actually doing. And, you know, for folks who are just getting started, you know, some areas where I would recommend. You know, again, personalization is a key one. That is kind of the holy grail of big data, time series, predictive modeling, sentiment analysis, the recommendation engines that we built, the web log mining, et cetera. And then just real quick, you know, so you know, what is Intel doing here? You know, we're just a chip company, right? But really, all of this runs on, on hardware at the end of the day, right? So whether it's our storage solutions that are based on Xeons and our SSDs, our network, our technically with Ethernet, uh, mix switches, and even our compute, um, you know, particularly our E5. We run our heavy platform, like I mentioned, on the E5 2600s, and our MPPs on our E7s. So we've got the hardware solution, but it doesn't just end there. We've also are adding software to that. So we've got our Intel data platform, our distribution of Hadoop, as well as um, bringing graphics, graph search capabilities um, to the market and trying to make this easier for folks to adopt. So it's not just in the realm of the few, but we really want to see big data, the benefits of big data being realized by the masses. Um, here's just a slide on you know, Intel's data platform, what it entails. It's more than just Hadoop. Now we have things like Yarn and Spark and Sharp. Um, and so, you know, basically, we feel like we can provide some real value and differentiate across security, performance, and manageability. Um, you know, here's the, the data to, to show it. You know, 20x faster encryption. We're taking advantage of some of the silicon technologies. So, so summary, last slide. You know, encourage you guys to build a cost-effective, versatile big data platform. <clears throat> you know, the, the industry is more mature than ever. So, you know, there's it's even easier than ever to get started. So, I encourage you guys to. Uh, no, thanks.